The picturesque Channel Island of Jersey has long been known as a haven for millions of holidaymakers. A crime-free destination where residents still leave their doors open. But all that changed in 15 minutes on the 14th of August, 2011. I looked through the doorway into the lounge and, and saw a baby on the floor, and I, and I thought, I went, whoa, whoa, what's wrong with the baby? As the incident unfolded, more and more casualties come to light, and that was particularly distressing. In just minutes, Damien Zhezhovsky took six lives, brutally stabbing his wife, five-year-old daughter, baby son, father-in-law, his wife's friend and her daughter to death, before finally turning the knife on himself. There was a chilling gothic clarity about the method by which he killed his victims. Only the killer survived to face a trial that shocked the world. This is the story of what drove a father to kill. Jersey, a sun-drenched island in the English Channel, is a mecca for holiday makers and locals alike in search of the quiet life. It's a, a beautiful island for starters. It's a holiday island, uh, lots of beaches, a very safe place to bring up your children. Beautiful scenery, it's a great place to live, good quality of life. It's peaceful and it just has that quieter piece of life. The island also attracts immigrants in search of work and a beautiful place to settle. Living in Jersey is like living in a nice village where everything goes really slowly. There's not much to dislike about Jersey, really, on the outside. And it was here that Damien Zhezhovsky came to build his idyllic life. Born in Nowy Sonj in southern Poland in 1980, he briefly served in the army but afterwards struggled to find other work. So made the move to Jersey in 2004 to build a life there. His young girlfriend, Isabella Gartsko, was soon to follow, eager to establish a new life on the prosperous island. With a strong community of over 5,000 Poles, Jersey seemed like a perfect location to set up home. Damon and Isabella got married in Jersey in 2005. It was a very uh, small uh, ceremony, uh, only involving uh, Isabella's father, uh, Damon's brother as a witness, and a couple of closest friends. Life for the wedded couple appeared to be blooming. Kinga, their daughter, was born shortly after they got married. And about three years later, Isabella got pregnant with their second child. Katzper uh, was born in 2008. By the time their son was born, the family, now established within the community, were living in a terraced house on leafy Victoria Crescent in the capital, St. Helia, along with Isabella's father, Malik. Damien had secured work as a foreman's assistant and was employed on various building sites around the island. Damien was described as a hard-working man, a loving father, supporting his family and providing for his family. Isabella was always described by all of their friends as a loving mother. He would spend most of her time taking care of their children and uh, making sure that the dinner was ready when Damien came home. Uh, she would bake her own bread and she would take kids for, for walks and play with them in front um, of the flat. Isabella and Damien's friends believed that they were a happy couple and a typical young marriage with two young children. But this picture-perfect exterior was a far cry from the truth. Cracks were beginning to appear in their six-year marriage. Damien and Isabella wanted different futures. Szyszowski was keen for the family to return to Poland and was saving for a house there, whilst his wife saw their future in Jersey. 
As tensions grew, the couple decided to take a holiday in their native country in the summer of 2011, a break that was meant to bring them closer together. Damon and Isabella returned from their holiday in Poland on the 14th of August 2011. They've driven all the way from Poland and Damon was the only driver. Uh, so he was driving for over 23 hours straight. They arrived in St. Heli about eight o'clock in the morning and went straight to their flat in Victoria Crescent. Sunday, the 14th of August, 2011, was a perfect summer's day on the island. Despite the exhausting car journey home, Damien and Isabella decided to have a barbecue, inviting Isabella's best friend, Marta, and her daughter, Julia, to join them. At around 12.30, Isabella and her father, Marek, left uh, the flat to go and collect Marta and Julia and at the same time, Damien was uh, left at home to take care of the two children. Yet in their absence, the father of two made a decision that was to shock his wife. When Isabella Marek um, and both girls, Marta and Julia, arrived back at the address, uh, Isabella realized that the kids were home alone. Minutes later, Damien returned and unable to explain where he'd been, was confronted by his furious wife. Neighbors could hear some raised voices. It was to be the last argument they would ever have. First 999 calls were dialed at 14.58. One of the witnesses saw Damon chasing Isabella down the street whilst attacking her. On the 14th of August, 2011, the tranquility of peaceful island life on Jersey was shattered when a family barbecue ended in bloodshed. Initially, it was difficult to realize what was actually happening. They could clearly hear Isabella screaming and shouting, and they could see Damon stabbing her with a knife. I was on my way to my daughter's flat um, because we'd just moved her into La Villa Rothse, which is um, a flat alongside the Victoria Crescent. And uh, I received a phone call from her uh, to say, Dad, Dad, I think there's been a stabbing. When I arrived, there was blue lights and, and mayhem everywhere. As I went up to her flat, I noticed there were some people working on a casualty down uh, by the side of the flat uh, in an entranceway. Uh, doing compressions, uh, counting compressions. I was one of the first on the scene, and um, my priority is to establish uh, command and control. It was a chaotic scene, and it did take a few minutes to try and reconcile what was happening. Um, there were almost small pockets of incidents within a big incident, and even till a later time, it didn't really become clear what was happening. Knowing the training that Martin had, I saw him arrive, uh, and saw him as uh, being advantageous to, to, to the cause and um, requested that he try and help us, which he did, um, thankfully. It was still a very fast-moving event at that stage. The magnitude and the scale of, uh, of what had happened remained unclear. As I went into the flat, I saw two, two police officers working on um, somebody by uh, the entrance door to a, to a lounge. I was introduced to them very quickly as, as an off-duty fireman, uh, and I can help. Uh, and they immediately looked at me and said, help. So I um, immediately put some breaths into the casualty um, and noticed there was a, a lot of gurgling going on. And I said, uh, I'm gonna just feel for a pulse, because they said they couldn't feel a pulse. I couldn't trace one either. And as I did that, I looked and, and I noticed that um, there was still a, a knife in the casualty's back, and I said, whoa. Uh, you know, we're going to need to move that. And they went, no, 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 we can't. And, and a couple of thoughts went through my head. I need to remove it because I need to get him on his back. And then I'm thinking, well, if I remove it, more catastrophic bleeding. Uh, there was enough blood around anyway. So I tried a couple more breaths um, uh, and, and was unsuccessful. I felt for another pulse. And I said, um, guys, guys, I think we, you know, we've lost this guy. I said, I think he's, he, he may be dead. I checked uh, a watch and, and called a timeout uh, and said, um, 
you know, I think we've, we've lost him. Isabella's father, Marek, died where he fell, having been stabbed nine times. There was a point um, when I recall um, the first death being declared, and at that point, I already recognised the gravity of the incident. There were some very serious injuries. Um, but at the time of that death, I knew that because of what we were confronted with, this most certainly was a murder inquiry, and I declared it as such. And from that point, again, with my training um, and background, I knew the severity and the right pitch to place on this incident, notwithstanding the overriding response for some time was to try and save life. With one man dead, the police were faced with a large-scale investigation. But the situation was about to get much worse. It was then that I looked into, through the doorway into the lounge and, and saw uh, a baby on the floor. And I, and I thought, I went, whoa, whoa, what's wrong with the baby? Don't know, has, has the baby been checked? And couldn't feel a pulse uh, and saw that there was quite a lot of blood around the baby. So I checked again, double-checked treble checked, um, couldn't feel anything. I said, uh, I think the baby's gone. The baby was Casper, stabbed 13 times. He died aged just two years old. I was aware that we did have um, an attacker, uh, um, still outstanding. My role um, was to command the scene, but also try and safeguard the other people that were attending to victims. As emergency services tried to secure the scene, they were to make more gruesome discoveries. So we searched around in, in, the, in the flat uh, <clears throat> and went through to a back room, and uh, there was a, somebody face down uh, in the back room, but, but moved. So I just said, we've got somebody alive in here, um, and went in there straight away. That man was Damien Zhezhovsky, who at first looked like another victim. The casualty sort of moved and I, I, I turned him over and, and noticed there was lots of stab wounds. He was, he was half naked from the, from the chest down. There was lots of stab wounds all over, over the body. The casualty was, was, was moaning and conscious and um, was trying to get themselves comfortable. He was moving around a bit more and, and I noticed when he moved his arms that it, there was, he'd cut his wrists as well. So I'm, I'm thinking, this guy might be uh, the perpetrator here. So I asked him his name and he told me his name, uh, Damien. And uh, I asked him some questions. Uh, was there anybody else in the house? Things like that. And he said, yes, yeah. How many? He said, uh, six, he thinks. So um, I just said to the policeman, there's, there's other people in here. You know, uh, we need to look for other people. With two victims dead and one man seriously injured, this information meant four more people had potentially been attacked in the house. As the incident unfolded, more and more casualties come to light. And that was particularly distressing um, when children are involved and they were getting found as we looked deeper into the incident. Um, that was very difficult to deal with. And I think that caused both myself and my colleagues uh, and others that were um, responding to this a great deal of distress. Officers quickly realised that nobody had been spared, discovering two more females and two other children with horrific injuries. Four victims were taken to the hospital, all females. So Kinga, Julia, Isabella and Marta, Katzpe and Marek, both died at the scene inside the flat. It became, this is my job now, I just need to get through this and do the very best I can. We really focus on my job and and the very best we could to try and um, stop that position getting any worse. As the girls were rushed to hospital with multiple stab wounds, the only conscious person amid the devastation was 31-year-old Damien Zhezhovsky. Damien, for me, was another casualty, and he got treated exactly the same as the others in terms of we did our very best to try and preserve his life. The last casualty in the house, Zhezhovsky, was by now in a critical condition, having repeatedly stabbed himself. I was trying to keep the, the patient conscious and talking uh, because obviously he, he was losing a lot of blood. Um, he was drifting in and out of consciousness and, and moaning quite a lot. But the fact that he was breathing and that he was moving was a good thing, so we were just treating his wounds. Um, 
the ambulance uh, chief arrived and some more paramedics arrived uh, with some equipment. So we started dressing the wounds with some big wound pads, dressed his wrists, dressed his chest. Um, Realised we couldn't really carry him out, so I called for the, the chair. We were going to chairlift him out. Um, so we made him as comfortable as we could. Took him outside. I put him in the ambulance, spoke to the police. Obviously, the police had been listening to what I'd saying, and I said, this guy might, may have been the perpetrator. During that stage, um, the police inspector came in and found a knife by the door and just picked it up, and I went, whoa, <laughs> didn't notice that when I went in. I think that may have been the, the, the knife that he used to stab himself, uh, and may have been the knife that he used to stab other victims. I don't, didn't know at the time. The attacks had happened in almost every room of the small flat. Officers were now faced with one of the biggest crime scenes ever to hit the island. I do remember a phase that followed Damien where once all the casualties had left um, the scene, um, the second phase, if you like, then kicked in in terms of investigation, which was trying to preserve um, as best you can what, what was left behind. It's often referred to as the golden hour in police speak, police parlay. We recognise the importance of securing and preserving evidence. You only get one chance uh, at a crime scene, and as soon as you've been through it or um, you've released it, um, it's gone and you can't go back again. We had to pull the officers away from the area that had been um, dealing with such traumatic circumstances and then deal very clinically with what we had, which was a murder scene. While the crime scene was secured and police tried to uncover what had happened at Victoria Crescent, the horrific news was starting to break. The media interest started to build up. The local community wanted to know what would happen, as did the island's leaders, of course, and, and um, trying to establish the facts was actually quite challenging during those initial hours. I had to go and collect one of my, one of my boys so as I'm leaving the terrace, because the police are all over the place, there's very little you could do at the time, and they were making sure everybody was staying away, I just sent a tweet out saying, Victoria Crescent incident, avoid the area. I was up in St Peter's at, uh, at my girlfriend's place, and um, we were just it was a Sunday afternoon, and I, and I remember just um, flicking on my Facebook, and um, that's how the um, that's how I got to know about it because actually it was reported on Facebook before I heard anything in the media. I think people who were close by to the scene were were reporting updates on Facebook, so it was really probably one of the first crimes that, in Jersey that, that was broken on on social media. I, I would say it was soon after that that social media as a whole just exploded with. Facebook and, and, and Twitter with people sending questions out, making comments. People thought it was a madman gone run amok. Despite the social media frenzy, details of the tragedy were still limited as more and more islanders heard the news. It was a lovely sunny afternoon and uh, I'd been invited to a colleague's barbecue and I got a phone call. Uh, saying, can you come into work? An incident's happened and we may need you as a family liaison officer. The phone call indicated that there had been an incident involving knives and there may be children involved. Uh, I didn't realise when I first came into work the extent of the incident. Uh, it was when I got to the hospital. Uh, it was chaotic. Uh, it had been closed down. It was professional people in there only. and. I was asked to assist the doctor, and when I went into the first room, we were asked to pronounce life extinct on four victims who had been involved in the incident, who had been stabbed to death. And then we had to try and identify who the victims were, because no one had any identification with them. As family liaison officers began the harrowing task of identifying the victims, Family and friends were by now frantically trying to reach their loved ones. One of the victims' mobile kept ringing and receiving messages, so we kind of worked out from that the mobile number that was sending the messages. And my colleague goes back here looking up that data and managed to identify a relative and went and spoke to that relative. 
to see if they had any family who were in that vicinity that day. The person that was ringing was uh, Craig Dillahay, who was trying to locate his wife, Marta, and his daughter, Julia, because they should have been home at six o'clock that evening, and they hadn't returned. Craig already had an inkling that something was not right. Uh, he had been out for the afternoon, he was waiting for them to come back. When they hadn't came back, he had tried to phone his dad, couldn't get hold of his father. He went on his Facebook and he noticed there was comments that there had been an incident with fatalities at Victoria Crescent. And he started to panic because he knew that's where Martin and Julia were. The police faced devastating circumstances. Six people lay dead, attacked in the space of 15 minutes. And one man appeared to be the prime suspect. With life-threatening injuries inflicted on himself, the only man alive from this gruesome massacre would lie in hospital for hours before being questioned. He was heavily sedated on the Sunday evening due to his, his own injuries. He had a number of stab injuries, as we know, self-inflicted to his torso. Um, I think he had a punctured and collapsed lung, so he wasn't in a good way himself, so he was heavily sedated. I think it was the following day when he was conscious and we were confident that he was awake and he knew what was happening. I made the decision that he was a suspect. I declared him as a suspect. He remained in hospital for a week to 10 days under police guard and he was arrested on suspicion of uh, six murders. Heavily guarded and now the prime suspect. What would Damien Zhezhovsky reveal about the slaying of his wife, her father, friend, and three small children? In August of 2011, the States of Jersey police launched their first murder inquiry in seven years. Three children under the age of five and three adults had been stabbed to death in cold blood seemingly by a man they knew well. Why had a happy family barbecue ended in a massacre? The lenses through which we come to understand the family annihilator are lenses that we only put on post-event. And the two classic reactions post-event from extended family, from friends or from neighbours is that this is something they could never have predicted. This is just so out of character. This was a loving husband, a wonderful father. As people struggled to understand why a father would be driven to kill, some spoke out about changes they saw prior to the tragedy. Damon's friends saw a difference in him at around June, July 2011. They couldn't really um, say what was causing his different behavior. But they, they said that indeed he was very quiet, but you could tell that there was, there was tension in him. Um, however, he wouldn't talk about what was bothering him. The second lens is often, yeah, we did notice changes. We noticed that they never talked about what might be worrying them, but it was quite clear that there were some underlying issues. And in that sense, one hears a lot about Damien being described as uh, being a pressure cooker, as if he was about to explode. Damien's world changed when his plans to build a home in Poland fell through and his wife delivered a devastating blow. Around that time, Isabella informed Damien that she was having an affair. And she told him at the same time that it's finished. She, she will not see uh, that person again. Damien had a very traditional, hegemonic, masculine approach to his relationship with his partner and in his relationship towards his children. And that that was a very kind of stereotypical picture 
of what it meant to be male, what it meant to be in a relationship. And therefore, one gets the sense that ultimately his decision to annihilate his family came from his belief that somehow his wife had fallen short of the standards that he had expected. They were having some difficulties in their marriage. But then again, I think every marriage sometimes struggles with, with different things. Shortly following Isabella's admission, Krzyzewski hit rock bottom. In July 2011, Damien attempted suicide. He took an overdose and um, spent a night in a hospital. Following that, Damon and Isabella decided to try and work on their marriage again, try and save their marriage. Despite the bombshell, the couple were keen to save their crumbling marriage. And the family holiday back to Poland was key to building it back up. Isabella's relatives, they, they seemed very happy. They would say that Damien trying to help everyone. He was very polite. There was nothing that would concern them in any way uh, whatsoever. Yet somewhere along the way, the tension still ran high on their return. Are you looking to sort of build up a picture as to recent movements, recent contacts, who they'd spoken to, ultimately to try and find out what had happened and why? Isabella's best friend, Marta, and her daughter, Julia, were keen to welcome them back from their holiday. Isabella and Marta first met through a um, babysitter. They've been friends for quite a few years. They both uh, treated each other as best friends, and they would go either um, clubbing or to see a movie or do something together. I know they were very close. They knew they were back that day and were desperate to see them. And they had decided that they were going to go there for the day. Craig didn't want to go. Uh, he was at home with his other daughter and her friend because they had been asleep over there. Uh, so he decided to stay at home with them that afternoon. It was to be the last time Craig would ever see his wife and daughter alive. Everything started shortly after the barbecue had finished. We believe that three children were all um, in the front room of the flat. Katzper was sat on a chair at a dining table playing with some toys. Kinga was painting. She was very close to Katzper. And Julia was just a couple of steps away from them. We believe that at least Isabella uh, was together with the kids in the living room, supervising them. Damien used two kitchen knives that in all probability he took from a knife block in the kitchen. We believe that the first person to be attacked was Marek. Isabella's dad. Instrumentally, by killing the only other adult man first, he is removing immediately the one person who physically might have been able to have overcome him and prevent the family annihilation. At that time, he was sad watching some television. During that attack, he didn't move at all. This attack was actually very brutal. Knife used by Damien remained in Marek's body, actually stuck in his spinal cord. This compromised Marek's ability to walk. He literally crawled his way um, into a hallway and towards the living room. As Marek made a desperate attempt to move, Zhezhovsky quickly found his next victim. Katzper was attacked whilst he was playing with, with some car toys. 
and he was stabbed five times uh, to his chest. He remained seated, uh, but slammed onto a table with his back exposed. He received further eight stab wounds to his back um, and he fell to the floor where he died shortly after. Kinga was just next to him. She sustained altogether 16 stab wounds, three to the chest and some 13 to her back. Then Julia was attacked also in the living room and she also sustained 16 stab wounds to both front and back. She was attacked twice, first time in that living room, but we do know that at some point she got up off the floor and made her way towards the hallway where she was attacked for the second time. Um, she fell to the floor um, and didn't move from there. His wife would have viewed those other murders taking place and have been powerless to have done anything to have prevented those murders. So there's a way in which she is being punished even in the order of the victims that has been chosen. Her best friend, her best friend's daughter, and her own children. She is powerless to prevent this. It prolonged her pain, not only her pain physically, but her pain psychologically. After witnessing the brutality of the attacks on those closest to her, Isabella made a desperate attempt to flee for her life. We believe that Isabella was first attacked either in that living room or the hallway. There was a bloody uh, palm print on the wall just next to the door to the living room. She sustained three stab wounds to the chest that were fatal. However, for a short period of time, she was still able to move. And she ran through the flat, ran uh, through the hallway to two bedrooms, trying to escape from, from Damien. Whilst in, in that bathroom, Isabella made a desperate attempt to contact emergency services using Marek's phone. She actually dialed 997, which is a Polish emergency number. She then dropped the phone and ran out of the bathroom into the hallway. Around that time, Marta was exiting the flat. We are not sure where she was first attacked, but we do know it happened inside because her blood was found on the inside of the door. Isabella left the flat and ran down the road, uh, screaming and shouting, asking for help. Damien followed her outside and at some point, he caught up with her and attacked her again, stabbing her to her back. If you are stabbing someone, you are literally putting a knife that you're holding into their body. You feel the body. The blood will spurt from the body onto you. Often, you will be looking into the eyes of the person that you are killing. This is a very personal form of murder. The witnesses started shouting at Damien. We believe he pointed the knife towards them uh, in an attempt to stop them from getting any closer. And then he walked back inside the flat, stabbing him himself in the chest 
and close the door behind him. He fits that classic picture of the family annihilator who is seeking revenge on uh, a partner who has let him down and then also attempting to take his own life so that the criminal justice system can't judge him. He'll be the own, his own judge, as it were. And the fact that he has survived means, therefore, there are problems for the criminal justice system. Damien was found laying bloodstained in a small back bedroom and the, and the knife was beside him that was secured and that was obviously the second knife that, uh, that he used. Any murder's bad, and, and, and you deal, everyone deals with, you know, with hearing that news in their own way, but I think when you, when you hear that children are involved, I think that just throws a complete different dimension to the whole um, incident. It kind of leaves you pretty speechless, you know, and I think the whole community in Jersey were just absolutely shocked by it. As the community mourned, one vital question still remained unanswered. Why did Damien Zhezhovsky kill his family? If someone can kill six people, then you, you do question what was, a, you know, what was the guy's mental state at the time. How do we make sense of this man's behavior? Should we see this man's behavior as unique and without parallel and based on some of the underlying mental health problems that he has? Or should we simply see this as another piece in the jigsaw of this criminological phenomenon called family annihilation. You can hypothesize as to, you know, what the trigger was. Clearly there were domestic issues at play here. We'll never know why, I guess, Damien's actions extended beyond Isabella. What made a loving father massacre his entire family and their friends. Damien Zhezhovsky, a 31-year-old Polish immigrant, was now the number one suspect in the brutal killing of his wife, children, father-in-law, and friends. As police searched for the motive, the people of Jersey united in their grief and rallied round to show their sympathy and support to the victims' families. I attended the funerals and tried to support some of um, the friends of the family as well as family members that were present. And I have to say, I didn't see a single person in that church that wouldn't cry. All six victims were repatriated back to Poland for burial in their homeland, but not before memorial services had been held for them in Jersey. Mother and daughter Marta and Julia were buried in the same coffin, a heartbreaking reminder of how they had died together. There were some police officers, friends, but also strangers, and it just made me feel so proud of Jersey community because they all paid respect to the innocent victims of the horrific crime. But justice was still to come. Twelve months following the massacre, Jersey was under the spotlight for one of the most highly anticipated trials ever seen. Zhezhovsky, by now, had undergone extensive psychiatric tests at one of the UK's top security hospitals. But what would this reveal? We knew from one of the early pre-trial hearings that Damien Zhezhovsky, he accepted responsibility for the deaths by submitting a plea of manslaughter, which of course wasn't acceptable to us. We felt this was a case of murder. A devastating blow for officers on the case. Zhezhovsky claimed diminished responsibility, apparently hearing voices in his head on the day and revealing how the weeks prior were filled with rows with his wife, depression, and heavy drinking. But the prosecution argued very differently, claiming that Zhezhovsky switched his story during his medical assessments, casting doubts on his authenticity. The court heard how they felt he was in fact very controlling, 
with a history of violence, who ultimately couldn't handle the anger he felt towards his wife for her infidelity. In short, he was a pressure cooker who one day blew. I'm perfectly happy to accept that he has diminished responsibility, but within the events themselves, it seems to me that there was a chilling gothic clarity about the order in which he chose his victims and the method by which he killed his victims. There was a lot of conscious behavior in terms of what he did, and that conscious behavior suggests that at the moment that he committed these killings, there was a greater reasoned process that he was going through than I think was ultimately allowed for in court. I wouldn't begin to, to want to delve into somebody's mind that would make them do something like that. It was horrific. All I know is that um, something like that is pretty horrific, and for a father to do that to his children uh, and his loved ones uh, is beyond me. After a highly charged trial lasting 10 days, the verdict sent shockwaves through the people of Jersey and the rest of the world. In August, Szyzhowski was cleared of murder. He admitted the killings, but his defense argued that he was suffering moderate to severe depression, causing an onset of psychotic symptoms, which diminished his responsibility. I didn't want to see him come out of prison, that's for certain, uh, because I think the crimes that he committed were pretty horrendous. The controversial verdict meant Zhezhovsky would not be sent to prison for murder, but a lesser charge of manslaughter, a decision that devastated the families of those killed. Isabella's mum and Isabella's sister-in-law both reacted um, in anger. When I um, contacted them uh, on the day of the verdict, that was probably the most difficult day of this investigation for me. It's difficult because you just want justice, but what is justice? You know, it's never going to bring back the loved ones that you've lost. They were gone, and that's it. Why he murdered his wife, uh, his, his children, uh, his father-in-law, his wife's best friend and her daughter. I doubt that we'll ever know. In October 2012, Zhezhovsky was handed a 30-year term with a possible chance of parole in 20 years. He is currently serving his sentence at Full Sutton Maximum Security Prison in the UK. We want to see events like those that took place in Jersey as unique, but they're not unique. They fit a general pattern of family annihilation which is underpinned, propped up by issues such as the crisis of masculinity, by domestic violence. You know, one woman a week is killed by her partner. So that what happens in Jersey fits that pattern. Two children a week die at the hands of their parents or carers. So what happened in Jersey fits that pattern. So these aren't just tragic events. These are events that we can see patterns and underlying issues which should prompt us to take action, prompt us to take action in terms of taking domestic violence seriously. As Damien Zhezhovsky serves decades behind bars and islanders try to pick up the pieces, for family and friends of the six innocent victims, life will be forever scarred. I think we all like to think these things don't happen to us. But unfortunately, they have to happen to someone. And it's a lot to take in when you realize that someone is you. Mm -hmm.